We ready to rock and roll? All right, guys, ready to get started? I'm going to need a little bit more enthusiasm for your 2018 honorees. Can we give them a hand? Well, my name is Laurel Mintz. I run an agency down in Los Angeles called Elevate My Brand. I have been a member of Woody for the better part of a decade, hopefully I don't look it, um, and a longtime friend of the organization. And I'm honored to be here to introduce and interview the 2018 Women in Technology Hall of Famers. So thank you so much for being here with us. We're a little pressed for time, so if we're going to go down the road and just have a little introduction of the honorees, if you could just be brief so we can get to the questions quickly. Please go ahead and start. Um, Rhonda Childress, I'm the Vice President and uh, Chief Data Privacy, I'm something or not, Chief Data <laughs> Privacy Officer for Global Technology Services and IBM, and we're um, a service industry. That's one more that was really brief, I love it. You yeah. said sure. Let's go, Jake. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Feinler, otherwise known as Jake, and uh, I'm sort of a pioneer of the internet. We were the uh, second host on the internet, took two to make a network and I ran the Network Information Center at uh, SRI International. Perfect. Pioneer. So I'm Roz Ho, I'm the Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Consumer and Metadata Business at TiVo. Uh, I've been in this industry, in the technology industry, for over 30 years, don't tell anybody. Um, 22 years at Microsoft, a few years at Ericsson, and now with TiVo for the last year in the media and entertainment technology. Thank you. I'm Santosh Kurinik. I'm professor of electrical and microelectronic engineering at Rochester Institute of Technology. I've been in academics for the last 30 years, and I've been working very closely with semiconductor industry to bring the chip move movement all the way from a simple device to the device that we are going to use for artificial intelligence and the modern internet of things. So I educate workforce for this technology and my research is on electronic materials and devices ranging from telecommunications to all the way to energy and MEMS and microsystems. So it has been a very good ride for me for the last 40 years in this field and I'm grooming a lot of young women to go into the field of semiconductors so that they take the revolution to sub-nanometer node, and we will have the new technologies coming in the front. My current research is on brain-inspired memory devices and also reducing the cost of solar cells and increasing the efficiency for energy needs. So that's what I am. Perfect. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yan Bin Lee. I'm the Senior Vice President and General Manager at uh, Storage and Availability Business Unit at VMR, so that's quite a mouthful. I'm otherwise known as the high-tech girl in high heels, <laughs> so uh, I have been uh, an engineer for um, most part of my career until recently I started getting into business leadership. So Wonderful. it's such an honor to be part of this great, um, amazing panel. The honor is ours. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Rashmi Rao. I am the Global Head for Advanced Engineering and User Experience at uh, Harman, now a Samsung company. Um, I'm working on uh, making science fiction a reality every day, <laughs> and uh, most recently working on autonomous cars and connected cars. Prior to that, um, I was working at Apple, mm -hmm. and uh, Qualcomm, and a com couple of startups that were acquired by these two companies, and uh, I feel super fortunate to be in, in this group of people, um, pioneers of the internet. That is just incredible, uh, and, and, and all, all these accomplished women, so I, I feel really fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are really the fortunate ones, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your service and your leadership, and that's really what we're here to discuss is your journeys. So we're going to touch on a couple of different topics from challenges to inspiration to the things that really get you through the day. So let's get into it, shall we? All right, let's talk about... Um, being a woman in your field, obviously you are all in highly technical industries. Can you give um, a story where there was a moment where you felt like maybe this wasn't the right path for you and how did you push past that? 
anyone can answer. We've got a lot of questions to get through. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll go for it. I'll yeah. go for it. Um, about four and a half years ago, uh, I decided, I had my whole life set up in the Bay Area, uh, 21 years here, personal, professional life. About four and a half years ago, I decided to move to Detroit, uh, change my industry into automotive, um, and literally disrupt my life and start all over again. Um, it was one of the toughest decisions I've made, and as I, it was like moving to a new country. Um, really, it was like moving to a new country. And I'd done that already uh, 20 years ago, um, and so it was, it, what it did was when I went there, it really felt like um, I had to put on a beginner's mind, because no matter what I had done and what I had accomplished for 20 years, it was all again starting back up. Um, and at that point, I was like, do I really want to do this again? Um, it, it was learning, uh, e even though there is a lot of similarities, it was a humbling experience. Uh, coming, coming from Apple and having shipped product that is like 75 million pieces a quarter, you just you know, feel complacent in what you've done. Um, and I, it, there was a moment of time that like, do I really want to start all over again? And uh, I am so glad that I did. Uh, building up the relationships, uh, building up my credibility as an engineer, and then as a leader in a completely new space, uh, doing that with you know, my customers as well as uh, with my team. Um, and it helped me learn new things about myself. Um, and also, I was, like I was telling uh, Jake, uh, learn, you know, grow new muscles. And I think uh, that persistence is, is, is important. In, in because you will you will come across moments of self doubt, mm -hmm. um, but you know you push through that and when you do that, uh, you're like I'm glad I did that. It's beautiful. There's something really special about being again in that nascent stage and having to evolve, which it sounds like you did. What are some strategies that you ladies have used to support other women as they grow into new roles within your companies? Um, I have been. Uh, very fortunate to be supported by a lot of other amazing women, and uh, I'm trying to do the same with uh, women uh, around me as well. So one of the key theme that I've shared repeatedly with other women is to pursue the hard path, because uh, often, you know, first of all, we have so few women in technology, and gradually at each level, we have women attreating into. Uh, what I see as the softer path. You know, staying in a hard path, meaning stay in a truly technical role, uh, stay in a truly business-centric uh, role, and even though the hardest path sounds like very daunting, and we often have very few role models in it, it turned out to be the most rewarding and sometimes the, the easiest path in the end. So that's your tip to women out there. Yeah. Are there examples of how you've mentored, anyone on the panel has mentored? I know this is something that you take very seriously. I can add a point here that when I was growing up, when I joined science curriculum in India, and at that time, the number of women in science was very small, and I took the advantage that I was having good support from my teachers, but I moved from high school to college. In high school, I had mostly women teachers, and I went to all girls' school. But when I moved to university, it was co-education, and when I entered my classroom, there were 100 boys and about 20 girls in the physics class, and all teachers were men. And we learned how to say sir, or we, in those days we used to call teachers as sir, but I was used to madam before. Mm -hmm. But the moment we entered the classroom, somehow when I looked at the science being taught and the examples of Newton and Maxwell given to us, so we chose our role models as scientists, as engineers. So all men and women, we worked together and we competed aggressively with them. And that's what I tell my girl students in my class. I say you, since I teach class, and usually in my class also, I have very small percentage of women students. But when I teach them, I say you are here as future engineers. So you bring your strengths, and women especially have their own strengths. They can multitask and you bring your strength forward in the front. Give examples of your experience, share with others, and respect will come through. Again, as I said, don't self-doubt, don't limit yourself, and 
if you are shy, that's something that we have to help you out with them. So I work with my girl students and I tell them, express yourself and express your knowledge that you know and you will be identified, you will be recognized. It takes some time, it takes some courage and that's what we try to build in them. Absolutely, courage yeah. is key. I'll, yeah. I'll add something to that. I'm actually very um, passionate about the subject and one of the things I really do believe is we have to get more young girls interested yeah. in STEM very early. So I've uh, served on the board of the Boys and Girls Club of Silicon Valley as well as some other nonprofits. And what I try to do is to at least enable, and a lot of these are disadvantaged youths. Mm -hmm. So I try to at least paint mm -hmm. the picture that you can be a technologist, you can be a scientist, you can be a computer programmer. Um, so that you know, these are for a lot of girls whose you know, vision does not really go beyond you know, maybe being a, you know, a cos you know, cosmetologist. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just want to make sure that they understand that there are these opportunities out there. Absolutely. Jake, when you were growing up in the world, I mean, you're one of the <laughs> you know, founding members of WITI, really, um, in your career. What was that experience like? Did you have men helping you? Or was it a, a really challenging environment? Well, I never thought that I would go to college. I was the first one in my <laughs> family to go to college. And uh, I had a scholarship in advertising design. I thought it would be in the art field. <laughs> and uh, found it was at a co-op school. And I found out that uh, I went down to accept it. And I was so excited because it was a full scholarship for four years. And then they said, but you have to stay in the dorm the first year. Okay. And I didn't have the money to do that. And so I had to give up the scholarship. And I was devastated. But I thought, I'm going to go anyway. And there's this little school called West Liberty State College, 400 people in the school. And uh, the art department wasn't very good, but the chemistry department was, so I decided I would take chemistry instead. Uh, there was a professor there, Dr. Wenger. Uh, we weren't ACS accredited even. And he said, well, if you really want a career in chemistry, you're going to have to go on to graduate school. And I thought, He's crazy. We didn't even get, we just got to college. That was, you know, that was as much as I could even think of. And, uh, but he got every one of us into graduate school, dental school, or medical school, except a two. There were about 10 in our class, and two of the guys were, uh, uh, went into the service. And uh, so Dr. Wenger was definitely, and he, wow. he never treated me different than, you know. Uh, Amazing. He treated us all like, he was very tough. But he treated us all like, you know, whether you were going to produce or not produce, or it wasn't, it had no gender uh, association with it as far as I was concerned. Uh, so that, he was one of my, my mentors. Of course, Doug Engelbart was a very big mentor. And uh, my other boss, Don Nielsen, at, these were at SRI. Mentors are and, so uh, important for women coming up in this world. And I know that you've had quite a few mentors in your life. What I would like to know from you, Rhonda, is what are some of the great traits that you have experienced through your mentorship or through those that have brought you up um, through IBM? I, I think um, a couple, uh, some of it's reverse mentoring. Mm. Like Beth Redden, who's here with me now, um, and, and I think we talked a little bit about reverse mentoring earlier today taught me that of storytelling. So mm -hmm. instead of death by PowerPoint, which is an <laughs> IBM trait, by the way. We've all experienced. Yes. Um, it's the art of the storytelling, how to tell the story, and how to be cohesive, and how to read the data, and, and, and paint that picture with the data. And I've had some really good female mentors and male mentors, uh, sponsorship, and things like that. And I've had some poor mm -hmm. ones, where, where women have, have done poor characteristics. Um, one of them was, is, when there was a young lady, she was pregnant, very pregnant. She had edema in her legs. And I said, you know, why don't you not take the on-call and I'll take your on-call, thinking that I had the power to say whether I was going to work extra hours or not. I didn't get paid for it, so it didn't matter. And this female mentor, uh, our female manager got very upset because I did that. 
you know, how dare I, you know, treat her any differently than anybody else? And she I said, thought you were it, trying to trump her. Yeah, and I, I, so no I was like, I'm not trying to, to uh, yeah. <laughs> not, I'm not trying to, you know, if it had been a male, it would have been fine. Right. But because it was a female and we were giving her special treatment and these kinds of things. Hmm. And, and I don't view it like that. So I've had some awesome female mentors who have taught me, you know, how to do the business side and the technical side and in reverse mentoring. And I've had some, some maybe not so great mentors. Absolutely. I mean, we have had so many barriers. You ladies have had so many barriers to entry in your field. What do you think the most significant barrier to that entry has been for anyone on the panel? One of the barriers I found was, uh, of course, this is much earlier than all of you in this room. Uh, it was at, at SRI, and SRI was, I think, better than most companies, you were, if, you were in, if you were a technical woman, you were either a research assistant or a research associate. What does that say? No, exactly. <laughs> I mean, they didn't say you were an engineer, you were a computer mm -hmm. programmer or something yeah. like that. So the way I handled that as best I could was, first of all, I fought for titles. If there was a male that had a title and a female took that role, I, I fought management to make sure they got the same title, which didn't always happen, but I was pretty successful. But the other thing I did with women was I gave them money to manage, and that mm. got everybody's attention. Uh, we, had a ta we had a contract with uh, seven or eight tasks. I made each one of them, most of them were women, not all, made them task leaders. They managed the money. I never interfered with that. If, it, if management came to me and said, what about this or what about that, I'd say, this is the task leader. You have to talk to them. And that, that helped a lot with, to promote women and get people to understand that they had roles that were significant. Of course, in those days, the internet was so new, <laughs> you know, the titles were crazy. Nobody knew that there were any computer scientists at that point. They were all mostly engineers or uh, physicists. So for you, it was delegating. So that was what helped break down some of the barriers. Any other barriers or any other tips to break down barriers yeah. that you guys have experienced? Yeah, just, just, as, a, just as an example, and I think uh, you made this point, Ann Ben, is um, just without being discriminating, people assign tasks, soft tasks to mm. women, um, not the hard tasks, right? So go into... Uh, the technical program management, go into product management, don't, you know, that's kind of, as you grow in your career, people start putting you in those blocks. Um, and I think that is one of the barriers because you're basically sending a message that as this gets harder and harder and harder, you can't do this, so you move on here, and you, you help the people that are gonna do the real work. Um, and I think it, 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 is, it is a barrier. Um, and so one of the things to do is to ask for those assignments. Yes, they are tough assignments, but you ask for them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then nobody else is gonna do that for you, mm -hmm. right? You, they don't have, they're not clairvoyant. They don't know that you wanna continue to do those tasks. And uh, to me, that is very, very important that you make your uh, ambitions and desires uh, and expectations in terms of what you want to do very, very clear. I don't want to do soft tasks. I know I could do a fabulous job, but that's not what I really want to do. And it is important because whether it's you know managing money or, or running a business or, or making those decisions, that is really what gets the attention, you know, the bottom line, impacting the bottom line. Uh, inventing patents, and I'm so happy to have Rhonda here, 186, 130. 130. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Yeah, just, you know, 50 here and there. Um, those are the real things, and so it's not like the other, other tasks are not uh, important, but when it comes to the bottom line, uh, what impacts the bottom line, right? So ask for those assignments uh, and if you don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for you. I love that. You hear that, ladies? Go after it. That's what yeah. you have to do. Yeah. I would agree with that, too. Yeah. If you don't ask for what you want, you probably yeah, won't get it. it. Yeah. yeah, I think you have to put your step forward. You know, Sometimes they just simply objectify you that you are, like we had a Society of Women Engineers meeting, and they were 
trying to attract some girls to come to engineering and they were organizing a bake sale or some sort of doll sale mm -hmm. and I said, no, most of the students didn't like it. So we, you know, we want to show actual what engineers do. <laughs> so we brought an automotive vehicle and we showed how we fix the vehicles and all that. So mechanical engineers came along and a lot of women were challenged. I think we need to challenge young women that you can do big things along with these small things. Of course, we all have to do everything in life. We multitask, we learn to do, we collaborate more effectively. And I think that's what we have to strengthen their spirits, so their challenges. So we had a situation at one time in our university that our department was uh, broken into two departments and no one was willing to take the charge of the smaller department. And I went to the dean and I said, I'll take care of it. And th they were surprised that a woman becomes department head of microelectronic engineering with such little budget. And I said, I'll take the chance, I'll do it. So I went to National Science Foundation, wrote a big proposal to strengthen my department, got $2 million grant. Wow, amazing. And so that just sparked mm -hmm. the, our department, and then everybody thought, yes, she can do it. You know? <laughs> so I want all the women yes. to do that. Leading by example, amazing. Yes. So we've talked a lot about barriers and, um, and you know, having to overcome gender inequality issues. Let's flip it to something that's a little bit more positive. Let's talk about the accomplishments that you're the most proud of that you've created in your life. Let's start with you, Rhonda. My most, I think some of the um, patent ideas that we've come up with are, have been, and when I say we, I, I do it in a group. The royal we, the right, royal, But course. it's done in a group, but I became ill I had four pulmonary embolisms, two in each lung. Gosh. And um, for me to get out of the hospital, I was negotiating heavily, trust me, <laughs> to get out of the hospital, um, I had to do two things. One, I had to move and every so often, and I had to take medication now for the first time on a timed basis. And we came up with a pill bottle that was so different than anything else. It was done by smashing open a $20 IoT sensor and the premise, it's a sleeve, so it's this, your pill bottle sits in there, and when you push down to take off those child-proof caps, and then you tilt it, it knows that you've got the pill in your hand. 98% of the time, you're gonna take the medication. But it's a very simple sleeve that we developed to help people. And then the second part, the movement part, was is we sat down, and this was before the Fitbit and everything had these movement indicators saying you need to move more. Um, we actually designed, the guys designed a watch for me to remind me to move. So if I got off the train at DFW, it'd say, Rhonda, you have 45 minutes before you have to start boarding. Walk to the next, <laughs> you know, concourse or whatever. <laughs> and then the guys really wanted to put a negative feedback buzzer on there, but I sort of ixnaked out. <laughs> <one>, so, <laughs> yeah, there, there is a point that you go too mm -hmm. far. But, I mean, these are just a few of the things that, that we've done that, that I think really help you know, people, yeah, you amazing. know, do better things. Incredible. I love how you took your journey mm -hmm. and actually help use it to help other people. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great example of things that you should be very proud of. Mm -hmm. um, other examples of amazing work, things that you guys have accomplished. I think that's really what women in the room want to hear and the men. Don't be shy, ladies. <laughs> this is time for braggadociousness. I took great pride in putting a team together because mm -hmm. I think any manager is only as good as their team. Yes. And uh, we were lucky, I mean, in, in my day, it was eight to five with, the, with the, <laughs> an hour off for lunch, you know, that was the, the, and you were supposed to be there, even if you weren't doing anything. <laughs> and uh, so the, the fact that we were working on the internet, you couldn't get anything done at lots yeah. of times. So we worked all different hours. So that meant I could accommodate uh, some women that maybe had other problems, you know, children or whatever. Uh, one woman had a, a her mother with Alzheimer's, and, but they could, we could uh, accommodate them. And my, my, uh, my word to them was, you have to put in eight hours, but I don't care what eight hours, as long as you do your time or get your job done. But that, that was useful that we could break that, that pattern up, because particularly for women, you're supposed to be there on time mm -hmm. and not leave until five. You so know, creating kind of a flex schedule but was something you're very proud of. But the team was fantastic, and uh, the Nick was a, was a team of, of people, 50 or 60 people over 20 years. So, I mean, it wasn't one person. I happened to be the PI, but uh, yeah. you know, it was the people that did the work. And they were, I think, to a, almost to a person, they were very dedicated. And uh, I, really, I really took pride in that. Also, we had a lot of beginning women 
uh, nobody did these jobs. They weren't there before, you know, so, so I could just take somebody that was bright and smart and interested and get them started, and they really went up, went up the chain of, of uh, command Flex schedules fast. and mentorship. Those are the two from you. I love that. Yeah. Any I'm gonna, others? Yeah, I'm gonna add one. It's gonna be a slight de detour from what we've been talking about, because I think we all know we're, we're accomplished. We're on the Hall of Fame. We are very technical. Um, one of the things I'm personally proud of, um, so after I finished my undergrad, I went on to Indian Institute of Science to do my master's. And this was not in the 1970s or the 1930s, this was in 2000. Um, and I, I was one of the three women in the electrical engineering department. Um, and those of you who, who are here, the Indian Institute of Science is a huge campus, gigantic. And the electrical engineering department is in the corner of the campus. The library is in the center of the campus. And uh, when I went in, and this is, this is really Hidden Figures uh, kind of situation mm -hmm. here, but this is real, this was real. I was told that um, there is no ladies' restroom in the electrical engineering department. Mm -mm. And the closest was in the library. And that was literally a 20 minute walk. And this is not 1930s, mm -hmm. this is 2000. Oh this is 2000. And so, long story short, by the time I left, uh, suffice to say, there is a restroom in Indian Institute of Science in India in the electrical engineering yes. department. Yes. Uh, that Making has my name on happen. it. Yeah. You know, that has my name on it. I wouldn't say my name on it, but it is. Uh, it is. So, it, it, in, to me, that was acceptance that we belong there. We belong there. Because before that, it was, yeah, we have few people, few of the women come in, so we've never really thought about, even if there was one woman, then you should have, this is like basic stuff, mm -hmm. right? This was yeah. basic. It took, it took a while, it took about eight months. So imagine eight months of you know, having to plan uh, your, your bathroom, your bathroom schedule, <laughs> right? Uh, but that is one thing I'm really proud of, because it was more about not just what it symbolized than, than anything else. Amazing. Um, I think we can switch a little bit to, obviously you guys have accomplished so much and I love that bathroom story, but let's switch over to some tips that actually people in the audience can use because they're all, most of you are coming up in your career, you're looking to up level um, who you are within your company or maybe make a uh, move laterally or upward. Um, what are some tips that you would offer to uh, those who are coming uh, behind you to up level faster? Um, you know, one of the things I like to talk about is to have a career North Star. So um, I realized when I was very young, I was not thinking a lot about where I would like to go. And I see a lot of the similar things in um, uh, young people and also young women. So, so dream big and think, think big at an early age on what do you want to become, what you would like to accomplish, even though some of those goals may change as you gain more experience it is very important to have a big, audacious goal at an early age. I think I will add to that that self-thinking and self-study is really important. You mm -hmm. may be working under a boss or under a manager and you are instructed to do some things. So always suggest alternatives to what you're asked to do because that tells you how much you innovative you are and sometimes you don't say things. I give you an example when jo I joined PhD my advisor told me to do something. So he asked me, he was interested in making some special single crystals of magnetic materials and we didn't have enough instrumentation to do that. I spent two years on working on those crystals and I could grow about one or two millimeter crystal, couldn't, do, couldn't take me anywhere to do my PhD. And I then went and talked to some companies in my area who were developing magnetic materials for telecommunications and I talked to them and I said, I want to build your material because we can, Indian industry can use it. So I went back to my advisor and I said, I'm not going to work on this project. I'm going to make polycrystalline magnetic materials. They will go in space. And, and uh, India was dependent on German raw material. We were importing German material, which was very expensive. And I said, I'll use Indian material. I will purify it and I make the magnetic materials and now ferrite industry in India is doing well. 
because of that. Wow. So wow. We, that's what I started with PhD program. And when I finished my PhD, uh, I studied the effect of silicon in iron oxide, how silicon corrupts the iron oxide, how much we have to purify it. So that's the time that energy crisis hit our planet, and we wanted to make solar cells. Now, most of the silicon that's used for making solar cells has iron as the contamination. So I told my advisor, flip my role. Now I'm going to study the effect of iron and silicon, and I'll make, I'll guarantee I'll make you 10% solar cell in my garage. So we made those things. Wow, amazing. So wow. I want to suggest to young women, bring you those solutions. Tell your advisor. Your advisor is advising you, but you have to bring your inner uh, instincts into your research and into your planning of career. Amazing. And that will take you ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I will add to that. Yes. I think that um, I'll just share a story with you. When I started at Microsoft in 1991, I actually had worked at Hewlett Packard before that, so I was experienced. And mm -hmm. I got some tasks that I thought, yeah, this is pretty easy. Like, mm -hmm. it's really basic. And I was kind of sort of unhappy with mm -hmm. that. But what I did was, you know, there were all these other problems, other engineering problems that needed to be solved, and nobody was really working on it. So mm -hmm. I said, you know, no one assigned it to me. I just started working on it. <laughs> And you know, I, eventually I tell my boss, hey, I checked in some code. Hope you don't mind. <laughs> but yeah. you know, basically, yeah. I, I, my point is, you know, don't, don't confine yeah. yourself to your, what you've been mm -hmm. given. Yes. Like every, every boss has problems that they can't get to mm -hmm. or don't have enough resources to solve. So start thinking about that. So you can start, you know, it's training. Mm -hmm. it's, is what you did on a much more complex <laughs> scale, which is you know really changing your job. Amazing. Well, I can't see my time. I think that we have till 5.15, but I want to make sure that we have some time for questions, because yeah. these are the most amazing women in the entire conference, in my opinion, and they're probably consultants that none of you can afford. So <laughs> I highly recommend that you ask questions. If there are, there are microphones at either side. Do we have five minutes for questions? Yes? I'm going to take it. I don't hear anyone. Um, questions. Ladies, gentlemen, I know that these ladies have some amazing answers for you. Last year, we had some incredible feedback. I'll keep going if you don't have them. Who's going to be the bold one? Yes, okay. polka dots. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Um, thank you all so much for everything you've done for the industry. I'm getting started in my career, and so hearing from you guys has been really impactful. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any tangible habits, whether you do them daily, weekly, or monthly, that you think led to your success or helped set you apart? I'll take that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a to-do list. I have a to-be list. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what resonated here with, with the other uh, folks who mentioned that as well. Um, and I think you should, you should have that. You want to have whether it's for a week or a month or a year from now or two years from now, um, you will be surprised, you know? You will be really surprised uh, because when you think of it in the short term, uh, it seems, you know, it, it seems too short a time to do something. And when you think of the long term, it just seems too uncertain to do something. Uh, but if you, if you start documenting it and put, put it on a timeline, uh, it's a to be. It's not just about, you know, I want to be CEO of that, but a little bit more granular. Um, instead, of, instead of making it a to do, it, it makes it more like a task, uh, something that you invest in yourself. And it's important. It, it becomes even more important as you, you know, progress through your life. You find less and less time for yourself. Uh, you have a family, you, you're multitasking, you're doing so many things, but you should always take that time to create something that you want to be and invest your time to that. Uh, the other thing, you know, we are, like, we are inundated with information uh, today, right? So you can, you can spend your time reading a lot of information that might not be very helpful to you. Uh, so one of the things I try to do is very, Every morning, you know, I, I've curated my list of things that I like to read. Uh, I'm an information junkie. I really like to read. And so I, I 
try to get to that every morning for the first 30 minutes, and then I don't do anything for the next two, three hours uh, when I'm getting ready or doing other things. But it sets the tone of what your brain starts thinking and really connects, you, you start connecting dots between so many different areas, uh, you know, like ferrite materials. You don't know what to do with it, and then one day you're doing something with it, right? Uh, so, so, you know, think outside the box. Yeah, yes, you're doing a certain role, and you have to read about it because you have to keep yourself updated, but also kind of expand and try and try to do different things because who knows how, you know, with AI and others, what the future holds for us, right? Um, and so trying to think of it really, really long term, right? So to be list and then try to create a list that you can, in information sources that you can keep feeding your yourself. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that question. I think we actually only have time for one more. I would add before we do that, the five minute journal, if you guys haven't done it, it's a great way to be conscious in the morning and the evenings and it takes literally five minutes. It's a fantastic tool. Yes, last question. Okay, uh, you guys are so amazing. You, you know, you are so technical and have all this opportunity to mentor uh, women in technology. What what do you do outside of work? Do you find ways to, you know, achieve other other goals and, course, yeah. uh, and mentor life? other people? <laughs> Maybe Good I can question. That. Go ahead, Jake. Go ahead. Well, I paint watercolors because I'm trying to free my right brain before it atrophies. <laughs> <laughs> I ski. A lot. Skiing, exercise. Yeah. Yes. I used to race, actually. So okay, let me tell you. There's a little bit of that <laughs> adrenaline junkie thing, which I think I thought we all have. A little bit. Yeah. I have sure. a six-year-old, so that's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so, so much, guys. Thank you. And please join me in honoring and congratulating the 2018 Women in Technology Hall of Famer. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And we hope you will join us for cocktails and uh, this evening's festivities. Thank you.